So yes, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. William Sa. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists at the Westwood campus. And uh, you know, an interventional cardiologist is a cardiologist that does uh, invasive procedures on, on the heart. And so I wanted to talk to you about two uh, different aspects of heart disease uh, that we can treat with catheter-based techniques. So uh, the first uh, thing I wanted to talk about is coronary artery disease. And so first of all, what are the coronary arteries? Well, there are two main coronary arteries. There's the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. And they come off on opposite sides of the aorta, right above the aortic valve. And the left main artery comes off first. And it splits into two, into the LAD, the left anterior descending artery, and on the left side, the circumflex. On the right side, it's the right coronary artery. And these are the vessels that run on the outside of the heart. They carry oxygen-rich blood to the heart muscle. And sometimes gunk can accumulate in the pipes, just like in, the, in, the, in your house. And that can lead to reduced blood flow. And if that happens, there can be decreased oxygen to the heart muscle. And if there's complete lack of blood to the heart muscle, that can actually lead to a heart attack. So here is you know, some diagrams to show you how coronary atherosclerosis can occur. So atherosclerosis is hardening of the arteries due to cholesterol buildup. And first off, let's start off with a normal artery. You've got the inner layer of the artery, which is the intima. You've got then the medial layer, which is the media. And then you've got the outer layer, which consists of the adventitia. And it's within the media that you get cholesterol buildup um, in the artery. And this you know, is a process that actually starts off in childhood and takes decades to actually you know, progress to where it becomes severe aortic stenosis. So sometimes these plaques can get uh, bigger, but they're not vulnerable, meaning that they're prone to rupture. And you can have stable coronary artery disease and have a, um, a struct obstructed lumen uh, with reduced blood flow, but not have a heart attack. But the more, ins uh, more dangerous type of plaque are these vulnerable plaques that have a lot of cholesterol buildup in them, and those plaques can rupture and cause a, a blood clot to form on that plaque, and that can lead to uh, heart damage and what we call a heart attack, all right? So um, patients that have heart disease, coronary artery blockages, often will present with angina. And that's a type of a, uh, term that we use to describe chest pain. So typical angina is frequently described as left-sided chest pain, pressure, or tightness. Um, sometimes people will say that they feel like there's an elephant sitting on their chest. Uh, the pain can radiate to the left shoulder, to the jaw, or, to, or sometimes to the back. Uh, can be associated with nausea, vomiting, and breaking out in a cold sweat. Uh, it oftentimes is worse with exertion and improves when you rest. Um, and angina without any exertion, so if you're, if you're at rest and not having angina, that's very concerning of having a heart attack. So I showed you at first a picture of a man holding his chest, but women also can have heart attacks. And you know, most people don't realize that heart disease is still the number one uh, killer for women. Um, it's not stuff like breast cancer or um, anything else, but it's actually heart disease. So, you know, women should also be aware of what the typical symptoms are. So stable coronary artery disease is the majority. And so how can we detect coronary artery disease non-invasively? We have different modalities that we can do to do stress testing. So we've got the treadmill electrocardiogram, and that involves putting a 12-lead EKG on the chest and exercising a patient on the treadmill. Uh, sometimes patients cannot walk. So we have other ways to uh, stress the heart using medication. So a medicine called dobutamine can actually make the heart uh, beat harder and faster. Another medicine called Lexiscan can dilate the heart arteries. And we use different modalities of imaging, either by echocardiogram or by nuclear imaging to actually assess wall motion or blood perfusion. So these are just a couple of pictures here. This is a gentleman here doing a treadmill EKG. This is a picture of an echocardiogram looking at the different walls of the heart. And unfortunately, this is not in motion, but we'd be seeing if how well everything is contracting. This is a myocardial perfusion scan, so we're trying to see how well the blood flow is um, between rest and stress imaging. And this is just a picture of a cardiac MRI. So these tests are sort of designed to pick up those blockages that are severe. So blockages that are greater than 70% narrowed, 
these tests can be pretty accurate in picking up those types of blockages. So blockages that are not severe oftentimes are missed um, with these types of tests. So when do we perform invasive cardiac catheterization? Uh, if a patient has symptoms of coronary artery blockage, so if they have angina, um, that would be one reason uh, to maybe go to a cardiac cath procedure. But some patients don't have typical angina. Some patients uh, can have just shortness of breath, especially in diabetic patients. Uh, their, their, the symptom can just be shortness of breath. Sometimes uh, people will say that they feel like they're having heartburn, and sometimes it could just be feeling tired. Um, if a patient has an abnormal stress test, that would be another reason uh, to have a cardiac catheterization. And then obviously if a patient's having a heart attack, that's an urgent indication for cardiac catheterization so that we can find a blocked artery and open it up right away because we don't want um, permanent heart damage. So I don't know if you guys remember um, Tim Russert. Tim Russert was uh, working um, in his office at in the age of, age of 58. He started having chest pain in the office and he actually died. Um, and uh, on autopsy, it was found that he had a complete blockage of his LAD artery. So interestingly, um, he had a stress test just a few months before his death and it was normal. And so why is that? It's because the vulnerable plaques usually are not severely narrowed. They're usually 30, 40 percent blockages and they undergo something called plaque rupture. So here is, um, I can get my, so here is an animation of how a plaque can rupture. You've got a, a lesion there that's vulnerable and a, it, this wall here is getting stressed and it's going to burst and the contents of that plaque is going to get exposed to the bloodstream and the blood clot forms. And once you have complete blockage of blood flow, the heart muscle is not able to do its pumping function and the patient can go into cardiac arrest. Okay? So in this type of situation, if the patient is you know, still alive, comes to the emergency room, having symptoms suggestive of a heart attack, uh, gets an EKG that uh, also demonstrates that there is a blockage in the heart artery, we would take this patient emergently to the cath lab and try to open up that artery right away. So what is cardiac catheterization? Well, cardiac catheterization is an invasive procedure in which a catheter is inserted into a peripheral artery, either in the arm or in the leg, and this catheter is placed into the ostium of the heart artery, and that's how we can perform angiography. We inject contrast dye through that catheter, and we can actually see the dye flowing through the arteries using a special x-ray called fluoroscopy. Okay? So here is a catheter that was placed um, via the arm, and it's sitting right at the opening of the left coronary artery. This is the LAD artery coming down here, and if you look right here, there's a narrowing, almost a complete blockage of that LAD artery. And this patient was not having um, a heart attack, but every time he played tennis, he was having angina. Yes. When the correct time to ask a question would be, but in Tim Russert's case, for instance, if he had had this, you know, clear stress test, uh, so recently to his uh, heart attack, I guess, what other tests could he have had, or might his doctor have suggested? Yeah. So it's really hard to know for sure because you know he, he unfortunately passed away, but, but I mean, we could have. Anything else that would have been suggestive of? Yeah. Even if we had done a cardiac cath on Tim Russert, um, we may have not actually seen a blockage that was se severe enough where we'd even consider doing anything invasively with, with like a stent. Um, oftentimes blood work will show whether or not there's elevated cholesterol. And we know that cholesterol lowering can actually help prevent progression of plaque and actually stabilize plaques so they're not vulnerable to rupture. So I'm not sure what medications he was on and what dosage of medicine he was on, but if, you know, if, he did have, if he did have elevated cholesterol, then lowering that obviously would have potentially prevented his death. Um, if he was a diabetic and making sure that you know, his diabetes was under good control, I don't know if he was a smoker or not, so stopping smoking obviously also uh, can help. And then if he had high blood pressure, making sure his blood pressure was under good control as well. So these are all things that you know, can be done to modify risk and to optimize medical management of those risk factors. Yes, sir. Is there any test which will determine 
the nature of the pie since I, I guess you're suggesting that that was a uh, yeah. problem in this case. Uh, is there anything without intervention yeah. to determine the nature of it? So one way invasively to, uh, to characterize plaque would be to do intravascular imaging. So like intravascular ultrasound can give us a lot of information about plaque composition. There's also other newer techniques invasively like optical coherence tomography, OCT, or near infrared spectroscopy that can also help to determine you know, some lesion characteristics. Non-invasively, the one promising area is the use of cardiac uh, CT, CAT scan. So the cardiac CAT scan now with its you know, advances in, in its technology, where we actually have now multi-slice detectors and uh, better EKG gating, uh, better image resolution, you know, we're able to kind of see also what's in the wall of the artery and not just a luminogram. So here when we do angiography, we're just taking a look at the lumen of the artery, just the, the, you know, the flow. Is, so. is, is there what, what is called a chest angiography, what, angiogram, would that determine these specifics regarding the uh, the, uh, heart. Yeah, it's it can. You know, sometimes we can see, you know, the actual necrotic core in, in the chest, of the of the coronary artery by the CT scan. Um, sometimes there's like spotty calcification, um, a lot of positive remodeling of the vessel. These are all things that are associated with vulnerable plaques on the on the CAT scan. Okay. So. Um, Usually, the cardiac catheterization procedure is done from the groin. And there's a couple reasons why this has been the case. Um, the femoral artery is a much larger artery in diameter, usually you know, 6 to 10 millimeters in its diameter. So it's much easier to access with a needle. Um, and specially shaped catheters um, make cannulation of the heart arteries easier from the groin. So it's not a very difficult procedure to do from the groin. Um, although it's easier to perform the procedure from the groin, uh, there can be devastating complications, albeit it is rare for these complications to happen, but you can have some potential devastating complications. And so some of those complications, the most common would be a hematoma, and that's just a blood collection at the site of the catheterization. Um, these usually are more just painful than actually life-threatening, um, but you can end up with a pretty big bruise um, with a, a groin hematoma. Uh, sometimes you can have damage to the artery, what we call a pseudoaneurysm, um, but the things that we worry about the most uh, in terms of groin complication is acute vessel closure. So if the, uh, the vessel actually closes down completely, the leg can become ischemic, and that, you know, that would be a problem. And then this is actually a very potentially deadly complication, which, which would be retroperitoneal hemorrhage, in which blood then is bleeding into the retroperitoneal space in the abdomen, and a patient can actually bleed out completely and actually have um, a very lethal complication. So um, I, I apologize for the next graphic, but it's just to um, um, bring home the point that sometimes you can have massive blood in the groin from a groin procedure. And here's an angiogram showing that this puncture site is actively bleeding, and this is contrast exteriorization into the soft tissue. Um, this next picture here is an example of a complication from a commonly used closure device called the angioseal in which the um, collagen plug ended up getting uh, put into the artery and that led to um, a thrombotic occlusion of the artery and the vascular surgeon had to get that out. So as I said, although the groin procedure is easier to perform, these complications can happen. And so because of that, a lot of, um, especially outside the U.S., a lot of cardiologists have moved to the arm. Okay. So the arm has two arteries that go to the hand. There's the radial artery that's closer to the thumb, and then the ulnar artery that runs closer to your pinky finger. And so the radial artery, although it's a smaller artery, the procedure still can be done through the small artery, and the, there's less vascular complications and less bleeding. And it's because the radial artery is very superficial, and if there were bleeding, we'd be able to see it right away. And there's, um, because it's in a tight space, there's less chance of a pseudoaneurysm. So why, why do cardiac catheterization from the arm? One, it's safe, safer for the patient, and it's also more comfortable for the patient. Okay. So, yes, we do. Yes. So 
Um, so I, this, it's all about the patient, why we do the pa uh, procedure from the arm. In terms of patient safety, there's, the bleeding complications are rare. Since we're not going from the groin, we're not going to get a hematoma in the groin, and we're definitely not going to get a retroperitoneal bleed, which is, could be potentially deadly. And then there's no need for vascular closure devices um, and its associated complications. So a vascular closure device can get infected or it can embolize and cause other problems. So in terms of patient comfort, because we're doing the procedure from the arm, we don't have to lay the patient flat after the procedure. After a groin procedure, sometimes the patients have to stay completely flat for up to four to six hours. And for patients that have back pain, that can be very excruciating. So we're able to sit the patients up right away. You know, we ask patients to be um, fasting for the procedure. So oftentimes patients are hungry, very difficult to eat after the procedure while lying flat. So it's much easier to, for you to eat sitting upright. Um, if you have to go to the restroom, you know, it's much easier to just walk to the restroom. You could do that after a, a, an arm procedure. You wouldn't be able to do that from the groin. You'd have to use like a bedpan or a urinal. Um, so if sometimes we, if we don't use a closure device, in order to gain um, blood control on the groin arteries and to stop bleeding, manual pressure has to be applied to the groin. So you'll have somebody actually holding pressure on your groin. Sometimes that can be a little bit embarrassing. So, Here's a picture of a patient of mine uh, that underwent uh, a radial cardiac catheterization. And you can see him sitting up, drinking a, a, a cup of water because he was thirsty. And here's a wristband that's uh, holding pressure on the access site. Uh, and he's looking pretty happy. So, you know, I, I often ask, which, uh, which way would you choose? Would you have, would you, wouldn't you like to rather have a procedure from the arm and just have a little wristband on holding pressure? Or do you want one of our cath lab techs holding pressure for 20 minutes on your, on your groin? Didn't they use so, sandbags and stuff? They used to do 20 minutes of pressure and then a sandbag on top of that to yeah. continue on the pressure. So we don't use sandbags anymore. But, you know, I think most people would rather choose the, uh, the wristband. That's pretty scary. <laughs> so going back to um, my tennis player, you know, he had this blockage in his uh, left anterior descending artery, the LAD. And we can actually fix this also from the wrist approach. So here we have um, a wire now going down the artery. And once we have a wire in the artery, we can advance our balloon and our stent to fix this blockage. So here's a balloon that was used to um, inflate a stent. So now we've been put a stent here in the middle of that left anterior descending artery. And now when we take our picture of the angiogram, you've got nice flow and that stent, uh, that blockage has gone away, okay? So we're able to actually fix these arteries from the wrist approach also. So the catheters are clearly getting smaller and smaller. They are getting smaller, yeah. Um, yes? Is it distance would be different from going from here or from arm? Um, the distance is about the same. same because way. when we go from the arm, we have to make this turn here in the shoulder. When we go from the groin, we have to make this turn over here in the, in the aortic arch. So the distance actually is about the same. How far is the catheter goes all the way to the heart? Yes. So this catheter is sitting right above the aortic valve. The aortic valve is here. The heart pump is here. So we've, we've got this catheter right up against the heart. Okay. And this one is only for the heart? This is for the heart artery. Yeah. There are, uh, there are now neuro, uh, some interventional neuroradiologists that are also fixing carotid arteries and sometimes even the brain arteries through a wrist approach also. But it's really been interventional cardiology that has really led the way so far in the radial procedure, in the arm procedure. So as I mentioned, you know, this technique really was, um, became more popular outside the U.S. So like many other things, including cars, electronics, et cetera, the U.S. really is no longer a world leader in interventional cardiology. So if you look at places like France um, and also Japan, you know, their utilization of radial procedures is above 50 percent, even sometimes as high as 80 percent. But if you look at the U.S., the U.S. only had 1.7 percent radial procedures that year. So um, the Middle East and Africa were the only other regions with similarly low transradial utilization. So the question becomes why? So why aren't all cardiologists performing radial procedures? Um, because it's more comfortable for the patient, it's safer for the patient. Well, they may not have been trained. 
in the radial approach. And because the radial artery is smaller, it can sometimes be more, it would be harder to actually access the vessel with a needle. And then engaging the heart arteries with the catheter also can be more difficult coming from the arm. So in the beginning of the learning curve, radial procedures can take longer. But once you get through that learning curve, the radial procedure actually ends up becoming faster. Okay. So the, uh, the European Society actually um, you know, published this learning steps and competency levels. So level one would be considered you know, diagnostic procedures in men first, since men usually have larger arteries, and then in female patients and then um, planned stable PCI in patients with type A or type B lesions. These are the very simple blockages to fix, um, not the complex lesions. You know, level two would be the older patients, the patients that are shorter because it, the catheter engagement can be dif more difficult than these types of patients. And then level three would be the heart attack patients. And the reason why the heart attack patients are in the level three is because when we are doing a heart attack patient, time is of the essence and you really want a, a skilled operator that can do the procedure quickly from the arm because time is muscle, and I'll talk about that in a second. So this type of heart attack, it's called an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Uh, this type of heart attack is the most deadly, and it's because it involves 100% blockage of an artery leading to complete occlusion of blood flow. Okay? So time is muscle. So the longer the heart artery is blocked, the more permanent damage is being done to the heart muscle. So we want to get that artery opened up right away. So once a heart attack patient comes through the door of the emergency room, the clock starts. And our goal is to open up that artery within 90 minutes of that patient reaching the emergency room. So many cardiologists are fearful of performing a radial pr procedure in this setting because they're, they are afraid they're not going to make that 90 minute time mark. Okay. But this was a study that was done in Italy. And this was a study that was randomizing patients one to one. So 50% of patients got a transradial procedure, 50% of patients got a groin procedure. And this was in patients that were presenting with a heart attack. And what this study showed that in those patients treated with the radial procedure, there was a 4% reduction in mortality uh, compared to the groin procedure. So not only is it uh, more comfortable for the patient, but this study showed that it's actually safer and actually can save lives. And it's primarily because of reduced bleeding complications. Uh, when a, a patient that comes with a heart attack bleeds from the groin, sometimes the necessary blood thinning medicines <coughs> after a stent are withheld. Or if a patient gets a blood transfusion, that can have a lot of detrimental effects in the recovery of that patient from the heart attack. Okay. So um, the statement here from the, Euro, the European Society is that Transradial intervention does not negatively affect the clinical effectiveness of percutaneous coronary intervention. When performed by trained operator, operators, it provides better outcomes, including survival, by reducing vascular access site-related bleeding in the heart attack patients. Okay. So um, what has the UCL experience been? Um, well, the, the radial program began in uh, 2011. And since that time, we've done over 1,000 radial procedures at UCLA Westwood. And this procedure also is being done, the radial approach is also being done at Santa Monica Hospital as well. So um, radial catheterization um, at both facilities is commonly being performed for heart attack patients. So uh, I think it's uh, good for you to know that you know, when you come uh, to either one of the facilities, you know, there is the, that potential option that you can be treated with a transradial procedure. Depending on the age of the doctor, it certainly wouldn't have been trained uh, when he got out of school, right? So How long does the training So we do, take? for training for interventional cardiology is one year beyond the general cardiology fellowship. Um, it, it is true that because this approach <laughs> has been adopted now more recently, that the younger physicians are more competent and comfortable with this approach, whereas the, sometimes the older cardiologists are a little bit more resistant in getting the procedure this way. What percentage of the UCLA doctors are using the um, radio method now? You said it was one point something. I would say that about 75% of our physicians are now okay, so comfortable yeah. doing, but not 100%, not but a good majority are good. comfortable doing it this way. Thank you. Okay. Good. Yes, sir. So if you go in through emergency and you're not uh, yeah, sometimes, uh, <laughs> right, so there is the, unfortunately that if you, you know, the person that's on call, uh, 
uh, may not be as uh, comfortable or skilled in the radial procedure. So ultimately, you want to go the route that the, the uh, physician is most comfortable with. And, and as I said, the groin complications are rare. Um, you know, we, with good femoral technique, you, know, the, you should be able to avoid a groin complication. But in general, the radial procedure ends up being safer. So I wanted to now shift gears into out of coronary artery disease, out of the radial approach, and then move to what the actual title of the talk was supposed to be, which is aortic stenosis, so the aortic valve. Okay? So um, coronary artery disease you know, is still very prevalent, but it's actually declining in its incidence and prevalence. And actually, heart attacks are also declining, and it's because of good medical therapy. So if a patient is on cholesterol medication, you know, they're, we're probably preventing a lot of heart attacks. So the interventional cardiologists you know, have gone a little bit bored and thinking, bored. <laughs> thinking, what else can we do invasively to the heart? And so now we've moved into the realm of structural heart disease. And what's become very exciting is now we have a new way of treating aortic stenosis. Okay, so we can do transcatheter valve therapies. And today I'm going to primarily talk about transcatheter valve implantation in the aortic position and specifically to treat aortic stenosis. And so there's two currently available devices, the Edward Sapien valve and the Medtronic core valve. Okay. So what is the aortic valve? The aortic, there's four major valves in the heart. There's two on the right side, the tricuspid valve and the pulmonic valve, and there's two on the left side, the mitral valve and the aortic valve. The aortic valve separates the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber, from the aorta, and the aorta is the main artery of the body. Okay? The purpose of the valve is to open to let the blood flow out, and then to close to prevent blood from coming back into the heart. Okay? So that's why it's called a valve, because it's, not, it's only allowing for one direction of flow. Okay? So this is what a normal aortic valve should look like on 3D transesophageal echo. So it's three leaflets, three scallops, okay? and the leaflets should be nice and thin, and that valve should open up all the way and close completely with each heart cycle. Okay? So as people get older, sometimes calcification can build up into those valve leaflets. And calcium is like a rock. And when it becomes hard, the leaflets are now not able to open up as they should. And that's what we're seeing here on this 3D uh, representation. So you see, still see the three leaflets, but it's all lumpy bumpy because of all the calcification. And now this valve is not opening as much as it should. And it's only this little pinhole that the blood is able to come out of. So, Age-related calcific aortic stenosis is the most common cause of aortic stenosis in this country, okay? And its prevalence increases with age. So how do we diagnose aortic stenosis? Well, we can actually simply take a stethoscope, st stethoscope to a patient's chest, and we can actually hear a murmur. And so if there's a murmur heard on chest auscultation, an echocardiogram can be ordered. And an echocardiogram is just an ultrasound of the heart and we can diagnose this uh, valve disorder that we're using echo. Okay? There are certain things that we look at on the echocardiogram to define if a patient has severe aortic stenosis. So we grade severity as mild, moderate, and severe. And it's typically only those patients that have severe aortic stenosis that are going to need any treatment. Okay? So uh, we look at the jet velocity. So we're able to use Doppler to measure the blood velocity across the aortic valve. So if the velocity is greater than four meters per second, that would actually be considered severe. We're looking at the pressure gradient. So if there is a, a narrowing of valve and as the heart pumps, there's going to be pressure buildup in the ventricle. And there's going to be a pressure difference between the ventricle and the aorta. So that pressure difference, the mean gradient, if it's above 40, that's considered severe aortic stenosis. And then there's a normal valve area should be well above 2.0 centimeters squared. If the valve area becomes less than 1.0 centimeters squared, that would actually also be another indicator of severe aortic stenosis. So echocardiogram is the mainstay for diagnosis. Okay. So as I said, age-related calcific aortic stenosis is the most common cause of aortic stenosis in this country, and its prevalence, prevalence steadily increases with age. So it's estimated that about 3% of uh, uh, patients over the age of 75 have critical aortic stenosis. Uh, 
So it again starts initially as progressive calcification, initially along the flexion lines at their bases, uh, which then leads to immobilization of one or more of those aortic cusps. And that leads to left ventricular outflow obstruction. And that obstruction is what then leads to symptoms. So what are the symptoms of aortic stenosis? So let's start off in this diagram up here with left ventricular outflow obstruction. As I said already, because of the obstruction, you're going to have an increased pressure in the pumping chamber. So you're going to have an increase in the left ventricular pressure. The heart muscle's compensatory mechanism is to become thicker. Okay. So, so just as if you were working out, let's say you were doing bicep curls, you know, your arm muscle will get bigger. If the heart has to work against extra um, afterload, more pressure, the heart muscle is going to get bigger. But when the heart muscle gets bigger, it's going to consume more oxygen. And if it consumes a lot more oxygen, it's going to then lead to myocardial ischemia, where there's not enough oxygen to what the heart muscle wants. And that can actually lead to chest pain. Over time, this increase in the left ventricular mass can then lead to um, left ventricular dysfunction, congestive heart failure. So LV failure can lead to pe pe people feeling short of breath. Okay? And then on the opposite side of the valve, you can have decreased aortic pressure over here, decreased aortic pressure, and people then can feel lightheaded, dizzy, and can even pass out. So the three symptoms to remember in aortic stenosis is syncope or passing out, okay. um, angina, okay, so heart, uh, chest pain, or shortness of breath, congestive heart failure. Okay. So oftentimes it's when people walk, um, and it, sometimes when it gets really bad, it could just be even just walking across the room, but usually it's a little bit more distance. People will feel that, like that they're having air hunger, where they, they don't feel like they're getting enough air, or they, they're breathing more rapidly. So it's just a sensation that you're not getting enough air. Okay. Um, so this is to show that Aortic stenosis also doesn't occur overnight. It occurs over decades. Okay? So there's a long period where there's no symptoms and survival is, is steady. Okay? But once a patient develops symptoms, and it could be any of these three, it could be angina, syncope, or heart failure, that's when survival precipitously drops off. So it's really important to determine if somebody with aortic stenosis has symptoms because we know that patients will then start having mortality if we don't treat it right away. Okay. <laughs> so this was, this was actually, um, good, and you, it was very astute that you point out the age, uh, timeline here. This was actually published initially in the 1960s. So this is a very old graph. And this is to show what happens in the natural history of untreated patients. So nowadays, if a patient at the age of 60 has symptoms of aortic stenosis um, and has severe aortic stenosis by echo, they'll get a valve replacement. And so that's actually going to let them live longer. So, okay. So if you if you've been having echocardiogram, right, mm -hmm. periodically, and they didn't find anything, that means you're okay. So um, it periodically, you know, depends on how often the echocardiogram is being done. Oftentimes, we first see just mild aortic stenosis, and somebody can maybe then live the rest of their life without having any trouble. Some people progress from mild and to moderate and to severe in a relatively short period of time. So, you know, the, your physician should actually just take, you know, their stethoscope and listen to the quality of the murmur. And if the murmur is getting louder or there's other evidence that the valve is getting more tight or more narrowed, then another echocardiogram should be done. And then if you're having symptoms, then we should treat you for your aortic stenosis. Yeah. So the question is, is there anything that can be done to slow the progression right. of aortic stenosis? Um, we're not sure. And that's a good area of research that we would really uh, like to uh, delve more into. There was a study looking to see if cholesterol medication can help slow the progression of aortic stenosis, and it really didn't work. So, uh, but I, but that's, that is an area of research where if we can f somehow figure out how to prevent progression of aortic stenosis, that would be a, a really good thing. Yes, sir. Can I talk to you with a stethoscope to distinguish between a murmur from the aorta and the mitral valve? We should be able to because you listen to different windows on auscultation. So up here in the right upper sternal border, that's usually where we listen for the aortic valve. 
the mitral valve we listen to more on the apex and into the axilla. So if the murmur is over here, more likely aortic valve. If the murmur is down by the apex and by the axilla, more likely the mitral. So we should be able to distinguish just by listening. Um, so here is a sobering perspective. So in patients that had severe inoperable aortic stenosis, so these were oftentimes elderly patients that had other comorbidities, they were not candidates for surgery. If they had severe inoperable aortic stenosis, their five-year survival is only 3%. Compare that to lung cancer. You know, lung cancer is a very deadly cancer. Oftentimes patients don't live that long after being diagnosed with lung cancer. Their five-year survival is 4%. So patients with severe inoperable aortic stenosis had a worse prognosis than a patient that had lung cancer. So it's very important that we actually diagnose this correctly and then treat it appropriately if a patient does have, you know, symptoms. Is this a fairly recent chart? Yes. Yes. Um, so this was taken from the Mayo Clinic, and this is to show that elderly patients also have, you know, a worse outcome when they have symptomatic severe aortic stenosis. And so it's estimated that at one year, untreated, an elderly patient has about a 50% mortality. So we want to you know, try to get to these patients earlier. Okay. So um, just to kind of go through the um, ACC AHA recommendations and how to treat aortic valve uh, stenosis, if a patient has severe aortic stenosis by the echocardiogram and if they have symptoms, that is a class one indication. Uh, meaning that it's very recommended uh, to have aortic valve replacement. And traditionally, that's been open heart surgery and a valve, taking, cutting out the valve and sewing in a new valve. If a patient is undergoing another open heart procedure, another class one indication uh, to replace that valve, um, sometimes elderly patients say that they don't have symptoms, but it's because they've modified their lifestyle to accommodate their symptoms. So let's say that a year before they were actually walking two blocks, maybe now they're only walking one block. Now they're not short of breath walking one block, but if they actually were still doing the two blocks, they would feel short of breath. So on those patients, if there's equivocal symptoms, sometimes we'll do an exercise test and get them on the treadmill and see what their symptoms are and also if they um, have an appropriate blood pressure response to exercise. If they actually drop their blood pressure during exercise, that's a bad sign too, and that means that their aortic valve should be treated. So sometimes patients have absolutely no symptoms and the left ventricular function is normal. Those are patients that we can kind of watch and wait until they have symptoms before we do a valve intervention, okay? So as I mentioned, you know, surgical aortic valve replacement had been the mainstay treatment until more recently. So here is just a picture of uh, the surgeon had, had opened up the aorta, cut out the aortic valve, and then sewed in a new tissue valve, okay? So in symptomatic patients with aortic stenosis, surgery has been shown to improve both symptoms as well as survival. But however, there has never been a randomized trial comparing aortic valve replacement to medical therapy. And that trial will never be done because we know that patients with severe aortic stenosis do better with surgery, okay? So common question is, is age a contraindication for surgery? So the guidelines specifically state that advanced age and these are patients in their 80s, 90s, is not a contraindication for surgery. But the decision to proceed with surgery in the elderly uh, patient depends on many factors, including patients' wishes and expectations. So I did my interventional training at the Mass General Hospital, and we were a site for the partner trial, which was looking at the transcatheter valve versus surgery um, in treating patients with aortic stenosis. So I actually witnessed a 98-year-old woman who came to be evaluated for the trial, and she got randomized. She th threw her dice and got randomized to surgery. So you, she was very disappointed that she couldn't get the transcatheter valve, but even at the age of 98, she did very well. She was only in the hospital for six days. She was up and walking around, and she lived a whole nother year before she died of non-cardiac causes. Mm -hmm. So this was testament to me that even a 98-year-old mm -hmm. could go undergo heart surgery and actually do very well. Um, so despite the recommendations um, that all symptomatic patients um, with severe aortic stenosis undergo aortic valve replacement, um, a significant number of patients don't undergo surgery uh, because of the comorbidities and the associated increases morbidity and mortality with surgery. So uh, Dr. Young et al. 
uh, in the European Heart Study showed that about a third of elderly patients that actually met indications for valve replacement did not undergo surgery because they were actually not even referred by their doctors. Okay. So patients are, you know, can be very fearful. You know, at that age, they just say, I'm too old to have open heart surgery, and they just refuse to have the procedure. So transcatheter aortic valve replacement has risen as a very promising alternative uh, therapy to open surgical aortic valve replacement in those patients that are deemed inoperable or high risk. Okay. Um, here is a picture of the very first transcatheter valve uh, that was placed in uh, Rouen, France by Dr. Alan Crabier in April 2002. And this is a very crude balloon with a stent that's been crimped onto this balloon. And then this procedure was done to treat a patient that was inoperable and essentially dying um, of his aortic stenosis. But this was the um, pioneering procedure that was done, which has then led to what we do today. So, what year was that again? 2002. So um, this is a procedure animation, uh, and Edwards is the company that makes the Sapien XT device. So as I said, you know, we can gain access to the groin artery, and we get a wire to go into the aorta and across that stenotic aortic valve. And once we get that wire into the heart, that ends up serving as our rail then to be able to deliver our balloon and stent. So this is the delivery sheath that the, our, our equipment is going to go through. And now we're advancing a balloon over that wire. And we're going to position it across that stenotic aortic valve. And we're going to inflate this balloon to crack it open to allow for more space for the stent. Okay. So once we take the balloon out, then we're going to advance our delivery stent delivery system. And we're going to then push it through the delivery sheath. The stent is here, crimped on the shaft. And then the balloon is up here. So we're going to bring this balloon back to align it with where the stent is. Okay. Once the balloon is aligned with the stent, then we're going to advance the whole system around the aortic arch. And then we're going to position the stent at the aortic position. Once in place, we're going to pull the pressure back. We're going to rapidly pace the heart to create cardiac standstill so that the stent doesn't move. We're going to inflate the balloon to inflate that stent. And once we deflate that balloon, the stent opens and closes with each um, heart cycle. Okay. So the stent uh, pushes the leaflets to the side. So the native aortic valve and its calcium is pushed to the side, and it serves as the anchor so that the stent doesn't fly away. Okay. So what we've essentially done is now we've implanted a tissue bioprosthetic valve in the aortic position without having to do open heart surgery. Okay. What does that procedure take? Takes the actual doing of the procedure takes about an hour and a half. The actual setup, you know, preparation and then post takes about three to four hours. So it is a procedure that we do under general anesthesia, but the actual accessing the vessel and positioning the valve takes about an hour, hour and a half. It's, it's, it's general anesthesia. Yes, it is. Yeah, sir. Um, what happens to the gunk that is? Yeah. That so. So where the valve was, the, the calcified valve leaflet, it just gets pushed to the side. And it's that calcium that's within that leaflet that's actually holding onto the valve so that it doesn't move. So it stays closed. Yes, it doesn't get cut out. It's, 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 it stayed in there and it's pushed to the side. It, 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 it gets scrunched to the side. Um, there is some potential for debris from the aortic valve to then come off the aortic valve. And that is one of the um, reasons why people can have a stroke with this procedure. Although the stroke rates are low, but you know, there is some debris that can come off that valve. What happens if the valve open and close? Which one is this artificial valve? It's all by pressure. So as the heart squeezes, the pressure builds up in the ventricle. It opens up the valve. Once the heart relaxes, the pressure in the ventricle falls, and then the valve closes. Oh, the, the artificial one will, will close. Will open and close with each heartbeat. So um, I can pass this around, if you like. So this is an actual model of a stent valve with some leaflets sewn onto it. So it's, it, that's the 23 millimeter size. There's three different sizes. There's a 23, 26, and 29 millimeter valve sizes. And that's, so the stent metal is made out of cobalt chromium, which is an alloy. And the leaflets are made from the heart lining of a cow, so bovine. Okay. 
<laughs> so I just wanted to uh, you know, share a, a, a case, a patient story. Uh, so this was an 82-year-old woman um, who presented actually in July of 2012 with acute congestive heart failure. And previously, she was known by her doctors to have severe aortic stenosis, but she was asymptomatic. But then she presented in July with shortness of breath. And an echocardiogram was done in her ejection fraction. A normal ejection fraction should be 55% or more. Her ejection fraction now is 20%. So that's severe left ventricular dysfunction. So she was referred by her primary cardiologist for the TAVR <laughs> procedure. So a balloon aortic valvuloplasty was done. And her EF improved after one month to about 30%. So we felt that it was now time for her to come and get the, her val definitive valve therapy. So when we put her under general anesthesia, we got a transesophageal echo probe to look at her left ventricular function. And this pump, this is the left ventricle, this pump is very unhappy. And sometimes we see that with general anesthesia. So her ejection <coughs> fraction now is back down to 15%. So we knew that we had to take care of this heart. Uh, and get this valve um, treated so that her heart can get stronger. Okay. Um, her left ventricular end diastolic volume was 251 millimeters, which is very dilated, um, very big. So here is the 2D, and that shows that this valve is not opening at all. Okay, it's very, very narrowed. And there's also a little bit of a leak coming back, too, on the valve. So she had both aortic stenosis as well as aortic regurgitation, so a leak. But not only that, her mitral valve, this is her mitral valve, had severe regurgitation. And it's because the ventricle was dilated, the mitral annulus also dilated, the le valve leaflets were not be able to coapt, and so it caused a severe leak in her mitral valve. So we, f we were hoping that by treating her aortic valve, decreasing the pressure in the ventricle, and allowing for the ventricle to get smaller again, that this mitral regurgitation would also go away. <coughs> right. So here is an, a fluoroscopic example of the TAVR procedure. We've got the wire here in the ventricle. We're going to inflate this balloon to inflate this stent. And then once the balloon is fully expanded, we deflate the balloon. We stop the rapid pacing. And now the heart is you know, opening and closing that valve. Okay. So now you can see this valve opening nice, you know, and, and widely open, um, allowing for a much better blood flow out of the heart. And there's no longer that leak <coughs> that we saw. And the leak in the mitral valve also got better, <coughs> pretty amazingly. And the ventricle looked a lot happier. So this ventricle is now more cylindrical, it's more slender, and its ejection fraction acutely increased to 30%, whereas previous was 15%. And correspondingly, her left ventricular endostyle volume also decreased from, it was 251, and now it's 168. And this is just a more dedicated look at the mitral valve regurgitation. It actually went completely away. We thought it was just going to get a little bit better. We weren't expecting <coughs> this. We weren't expecting that the mitral regurgitation would go completely away. And so here's an example of how one st fixing one valve actually fixed two valves. So we kind of called this, you know, killing two birds with one stone. So this is a picture of Our Lady. Um, she, this was just one day after her valve procedure. And um, here is a picture of her and her husband now 30 days after the procedure. And we saw her a year ago, and her ejection fraction completely normalized. Her, now her ejection fraction is 60%, which is a normal ejection fraction. And she's now living a very normal life. Um, so we ended up publishing this case uh, in one of our cardiology journals. And, we called it two birds with one stone. Okay. So um, just to give us some data uh, uh, related around uh, the Edward Sapien valve, the Sapien valve was the first FDA-approved transcatheter heart valve. Okay. Um, it was studied in the partner trial, which was a landmark trial. There were two different cohorts, which I'll talk about. There was the cohort B, which were those patients that were deemed inoperable. So these were patients that were not candidates for open heart surgery. Then there was cohort A. These were patients that were at high risk for open heart surgery. And these patients were randomized either to TAVR, the transcatheter procedure, or to open heart surgery. Okay. The Sapien valve was first FDA approved in November of 2011. So it's a relatively new procedure. Okay. So 358 patients were in the inoperable arm. And they were one-to-one uh, -one randomized to either the transcatheter therapy or medical therapy, 
so no valve, um, uh, no stent valve. But about 84% of these patients ended up getting balloon valvuloplasty. Okay. So this was a lot of, this was very exciting because this was the, the mortality uh, data. So at one year, the patients that were treated with just medicines and balloon valvuloplasty, they had a 50% mortality uh, when they, if they didn't get their valve treated. Those patients that were treated with TAVR, their mortality was 30%. So this was an absolute reduction of 20%. So this was very exciting. This, this was proof that fixing this aortic valve, even those patients that were inoperable, did lead to a 20% reduction in mortality. And it was based upon this study that the device got approved by the FDA. Um, this is to show that uh, patients, this, the New York Heart Association has a functional class classification in terms of how severe heart failure symptoms are. Uh, class one is no symptoms, class four is severe symptoms. And more patients in the uh, transcatheter arm had either class one or class two heart failure symptoms uh, versus um, the standard therapy. And then more patients in the standard therapy, the medical therapy arm, had either class three or class four heart failure symptoms. So this therapy was shown to improve symptoms as well as improve survival. Okay. So the other arm of the study was the cohort A, and these were patients that were considered high risk for surgery, and they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either transcatheter procedure or to open heart surgery. And what they were looking for in this part of the trial was to look for non-inferiority, to say that transcatheter procedure was the same in terms of mortality compared to open heart surgery. And that's what they showed here. So out to three years, the lines are essentially the same. So the TAVR procedure, in terms of mortality, was the same as with surgery. So this, they were equ equivalent. Okay. Same thing in terms of New York Heart Association functional class. They were similar in both arms. Okay. So as I mentioned, you know, because there can be some debris coming off the valve, there is a slightly increased risk of stroke. Uh, you know, surgery also has a increased, some risk of stroke. So in this study, the blue is the surgical arm. They had a 3% risk of stroke with open heart surgery. With the transcatheter procedure, it was 5.8% risk of stroke. Numerically higher, but statistically not significant. So there is a possibility that this difference is just due to chance. But still there is a numeric difference uh, between the two groups. So we've been talking about the Edwards Sapien valve that's in a balloon expandable stent. There is another stent, um, stent valve called the uh, Medtronic core valve. And it's uh, different in that this is a self-expanding stent. It's made out of nitinol, which has um, memory, shaped memory. And so it allows for then the, um, the stent to be a self-expanding uh, uh, prosthesis. And this is actually using um, porcine, so pig uh, tissue. So th they did also an another trial and they randomized patients either to core valve, the transcatheter procedure, or to open heart surgery, surgical aortic valve replacement. Interestingly, in this trial, they actually showed that patients that were treated with a transcatheter core valve in yellow, they had a lower mortality than in those patients that were treated with surgery. So in Sapien, with partner cohort A, they were equivalent. But with core valve, they actually showed that this was superior to surgery. So this was just um, released and announced earlier this year. So there's a lot of excitement about transcatheter valve therapies as actually maybe even being a better therapy than surgery. Um, this is also then just to go back to partner. Those patients that were treated from the groin approach, they actually also in the partner trial actually also looked like that they had a mortality benefit with the transcatheter procedure versus open heart surgery. So what are the typical characteristics of a transcatheter aortic valve replacement patient? So all of them obviously have severe aortic stenosis, but you know, age definitely comes into consideration. Frailty is a big thing. You know, a lot of patients are just too frail. Um, they're walking around with a walker. Uh, they're having falls. Maybe they have dementia. Maybe they're just not strong. We can actually assess for grip strength. You know, maybe they're just not walking fast. They're a little bit immobile. So frailty is definitely put into consideration. The other big things that contribute to risk is lung disease. So if you've been a smoker and have, have COPD, that also is a, a big risk factor. Kidney, uh, kidney disease is a big risk factor. And then peripheral vascular disease. Um, so blockages in the other arteries of the body means that there's more 
systemic atherosclerosis and hardening of the arteries. So that is another risk factor for um, increasing the risk of surgery. So we can actually calculate a patient's risk um, by going online, and there's an STS risk calculator. The STS is the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, and they have a risk model of predicting mortality with different types of open heart surgery. So we would put here that um, it's only going to be for a valve surgery. We're not doing a bypass operation. It's going to be on the aortic valve. And so we're going to try to predict the mortality for an isolated aortic valve replacement. And there's a whole bunch of stuff, including age, weight, height, kidney function, lung function, those types of things. And then we're able to get a risk, risk of mortality. And in this particular patient, the risk of mortality was over 8%. So greater than 8% would be considered high risk. Intermediate risk would be those patients that have an STS score between 4 and 8. And then low risk are those patients that have an STS score less than 4%. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, there's a couple different sizes on the valve, and we end up doing a CT scan on most patients to actually look at the aortic valve apparatus and to see what size would be appropriate. So here is um, a measurement of the aortic annulus, and we can choose the size of the valve based upon this area. Okay? We also can then also measure the heights of the coronary arteries using the CAT scan. When we inflate this valve, the native leaflets actually are going to be pushed out and up. And sometimes the left coronary artery can get compromised if the valve leaflet covers it. So we want to know uh, what this height is because we can then do a procedure that can help protect the left main artery with the valve implantation procedure. Okay. We can also make these measurements on 3D transesophageal echo. And we're, we've been uh, at UCLA getting good correlation uh, with our CT scan. So if a patient cannot get a CT scan or it's dangerous for them to get a CAT scan with contrast because of kidney function, we can sometimes use a transesophageal echo uh, to make some of the necessary measurements. So uh, one of the limitations of this procedure is that we have to advance this delivery sheath. And so this is on fluoroscopy, the delivery sheath being advanced through the aorta. And um, I did bring an example of this delivery sheath. So you can pass this around as well. Um, this is the smallest of the delivery sheets. That's the 16 French uh, device. Uh, but that's the size of the tube that has to go through the artery. So uh, you, can, uh, you can imagine that in a very small patient, maybe the artery isn't big enough uh, for this procedure from the groin. Or if the patient has blockages in the arteries in the groin, maybe that's going to get in the way of allowing us to, um, to get that delivery sheath in. So there are alternative ways that we can do the procedure. Uh, which I have a picture of also well, I'll get to in a second. So we can actually measure the aortic uh, and iliac uh, artery dimensions by using angiography. That's one way we can do it. But we can also do it by the CT scan. And this is just a 3D reconstruction of the um, aorta and its iliac vessels. And um, we can actually make cross-sectional measurements of the um, iliacs to know where there may be trouble in advancing the sheath. Um, to answer your question, sir, about aortic aneurysms, Oftentimes, in the abdominal aorta, that's where an outpouching of the aorta would occur, and that would be an, called an aortic aneurysm. Okay, so as I said, there's some alternative ways of uh, doing the procedure if the um, leg arteries are not big enough. One way is to do a transapical approach, so the surgeon will actually make a small incision on the side of the chest and expose the tip of the heart, and we can actually go through the heart itself. Um, in some ways, this procedure going from the tip of the heart is easier from a technical perspective because it's a straight shot. Um, there's much less distance to the valve when we go through the tip of the heart. But the downside is, is that we are creating a hole at the, uh, at the tip of the heart, and it is a, a still a surgical procedure. Um, whereas when we go from the groin, we could actually still potentially do it totally percutaneously without having to do any incisions. Um, so. The device that was first approved in 2011 was the first generation device. Uh, just recently, in the last few months, we've got the FDA approval of the Sapien XT device. Uh, the advantage of this device is that the metal is uh, cobalt chromium, and so it's actually thinner than the stainless steel first generation device. And um, the assembly system is also thinner, which allows then for more patients to be treated from the groin. Okay. Um, this is done to show that there's a huge difference between the delivery sheath sizes. The first generation device was a 22 French sheath, uh, and then, then the next generation device is an 18 French sheath, so much smaller. Okay. Is this as flexible as this gets? Yes, sir. Yeah. How does it go around? And so we do it, um, we, we advance that sheath 
on a wire, on a stiff wire. And the stiff wire oftentimes straightens out the vessel, so we don't have to make too many curves. Okay. So as I mentioned, this procedure right now is currently FDA indicated for only those patients that are either inoperable, so as the surgeon has said, you're not a candidate for open heart surgery, or for those patients that are at high risk, and that's an STS score greater than 8%. So what about the lower risk patient? So what about the intermediate risk patient? Actually, the vast majority of patients with severe aortic stenosis end up falling into this category, into the intermediate risk category. So right now, there are still two trials that are ongoing. There's the PARTNER2 trial, and that actually has already completed enrollment. We're just waiting for the follow-up. So we may be getting the intermediate risk indication maybe in the next year or two. And then the core valve uh, CERTAVI trial is still ongoing. So there's still a lot more um, to learn about this procedure, especially in the intermediate ri risk uh, cohort. Okay. Well, that's the Medtronic one. This the is the core valve is Medtronic, and then this one's Edwards. Right. Okay. So um, the are the delivery devices similar in terms of the diameter? Yes, so um, the core valve is an 18 French, um, and the uh, Edwards valve is now also 16, 18, 20 French. So they're very similar in its sizes. Okay. So um, what about valve and valve? So there's a lot of patients out there that have already had open heart surgery with a tissue prosthetic valve. And we typically say that a tissue prosthesis will last about 15 years before another procedure may be needed because of degeneration of that tissue valve. So this is actually going to be a very promising field too. So you know, as I said, you know, it's about 15 years before the valve uh, will degenerate. And we can actually implant this stent valve within the pre-existing tissue valve so that the patient doesn't have to have repeat heart surgery uh, to, you know, to treat their de degenerated valve. This is off-label use in the United States, uh, so it's not currently reimbursed by insurance, but there is a registry uh, within the PARTNER2 trial uh, so that patients in the U.S. can potentially still be treated for this. It's being routinely performed uh, in, the, um, in the European Union, so outside of U.S., uh, the valve and valve procedure is being routinely done. Okay. All right, so some humor here. So this is sort of the battle that's been going on uh, between interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery for the last few decades. And, you know, the cardiac surgeon has been feeling a little bit beat up by us because, you know, we're coming in with these nice, you know, fancy devices and the, these slick procedures. And, we're t you know, we're doing a lot more coronary angioplasty and stenting. And now we're doing, you know, transcatheter valve therapies. But this procedure actually is done as a team. And what this procedure has done is brought interventional, cardiac sur interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery together into the same room, doing the procedure together. And what it really has done is actually created a kind of a, a nice uh, marriage between the two specialties, so that now the, we're able to coexist together uh, in a very you know, fruitful and you know, rewarding um, experience. So, um, so why is it good to uh, treat uh, these patients as a, with a heart team approach? It's because all these different specialties, interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery, non-invasive cardiology, the echocardiographer, the operating room and the cath lab staff, the anesthesiologist, they all bring their expertise to the table in how to best treat the patient. So not all patients are suitable for TAVR. Okay? Um, surgical aortic repl valve replacement still remains the gold standard. Uh, that may be shifting, but right as of today, you know, surgical aortic valve replacement is still the gold standard. And the person that gains the most from this heart team approach is the patient. The patient gains the most benefit because their therapy is then tailored to what suits their needs. Okay? So um, as I mentioned, you know, this is a, a, a team approach, and so these are some of the key members of our team. All right. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, it's now a little bit uh, after 8 o'clock, and so I'll open to more questions. Just when you say somebody's inoperable, yes, sir. does that answer the question as far as whether Medicare is going to cover the TAVR? So um, Medicare will cover the TAVR procedure in those patients that have been evaluated by cardiac surgery and deemed inoperable. It is an FDA-indicated uh, indication. It, it will, cover it will be covered. If they're inoperable? Yes, sir. If they, oh, only if they're inoperable? Yes, if they're inoperable, oh. then the TAVR procedure it will be covered. So that's one of the qualifications to get TAVR is that you have to be uh, considered inoperable.
or high risk. How many total tabbers do you do a week? A week? I mean, not you personally, but in this also. country? Oh, in, no, no, no. no I, so I, I, so at UCLA, I say we do this as a team. So each of the team members are present for all the procedures. So I, I, we've done a total of 63 cases at UCLA, and I've been present for every single one of them. So we've done 63. The most we've done in a week was four. Um, this past week we just did one, but that you know it, it varies. We, next week we have two planned. So. And how do you decide whether to use the Edwards or the Metron? We currently only have the Edwards valve um, in our in our system. Uh, we just got approval uh, for the Medtronic core valve to be brought in. So we're hopefully going to be able to do that in the next upcoming months. But how would you decide? You must know what's, what the difference is. Like. We typically prefer the Edwards Sapien valve. Um, it's, a, it's an easier valve to deploy. Uh, but one of the main advantages is that um, the pacemaker rate after the valve procedure is much lower with Edwards Sapien versus the core valve. So when we in inflate this stent, there can be pressure put onto the conduction system of the heart and that can lead to complete heart block. So some patients need a pacemaker after this procedure. The estimate is about 5% in the Edwards balloon expandable patients. Uh, it's probably about 30% in the patients that have core valve. So a much higher rate of pacemaker uh, need after the core valve. Um, so we typically would still prefer the Edwards sapien. They also have such a chain with the Santa Monica UCLA. No, this procedure is not being done at Santa Monica. This procedure is only being done at the main campus at Westwood. So. Okay. So if you've been, you've been doing this for how long? We, and you've done 68 of them? We've, done, we've, we've been doing this procedure now for two years. Two years. So. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.